Thank you, Ambassador, for your kind introduction, and thank you all for joining this uh, roundtable, this, not roundtable, sorry, the, my presentation today. This is my first time to visit Dublin, uh, first time in Ireland, so it's really an honor to be part of the, this IIEA community um, and uh, contributing to some of my analysis to the discussion. Um, as Ambassador said, I'm going to speak about the rules-based order, what challenges, what kind of the problems it had in the past 20 years, and I will discuss what, how Japan perceived those challenges and discuss the Japan's free and open the Pacific vision in that context. And first of all, in terms of rules-based order, I have to define it in some way. Um, rules-based order is the order that the all entities, including government and then uh, private sectors, abide by the existing rules. So it's based on the principle rule of law. Once we agree on the rules, we have to abide by it. And why it is necessary? It's because it can increase the predictability of any issues. Of course, for business sectors, if we can agree on the rules and everyone thinks that everyone, every entity would abide by this, and people can expect or predict what's happened, or even if the uh, violation of rules incur some cost for the violators. So there's an incentive for all the participating uh, members to follow the rules. And this is actually not in the international arena or international relations. There's no perfect rules-based order. Individual state or a sovereign state has, still has its own autonomy in its policy. There's no principle of non-intervention and equality of states in the Westphalian system. So I cannot say that there's a perfect international rules-based order in the, in the post-1945, but still, Compared to the pre-war time, there is a better system in, in this world. We had the United Nations, we had a Breton system, including WTO, IMF, and World, sorry, WTO is not in the Breton system, but um, the uh, World Bank and IMF. Uh, there's an international arbitration system. Uh, United Nations uh, law of the, uh, Convention of the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, for example, preserves the predictable and free and open maritime order in the, in the world. So we had a better system. And now, and another key characteristic of this rules-based order in the post-1945 is that increase inclusivity, is that, that the countries, any countries, can be included when they satisfy with the survival conditions. Even Japan, which is the loser of the Second World War, could join the post-war order and can be the beneficiary. And at the end of the day, he became the uh, exemplary student of the rules-based order, um, despite the, some atrocious past. So this is, I think, the, my definition of the rules-based order. And um, in the past 20 years, there's a several challenges in this order. First of all, there's a changing balance of power, which can be the foundation of this rules-based order. In 19, well, 1989 to 1991, the Cold War ended. And after that, there's a unipolarity over the United States. U.S. is a predominant economic and military power in the world, and they preserved the system. But it's changed. Maybe after 28, the global financial crisis, and then China, I mean, this is the second factor, The China or the other emerging countries had a more economic presence in the region, in, in the world. Not, it's not just China, but it's also the India and then others. And finally, uh, there's some challenges within the liberal international, sorry, rules-based international order or the concept of liberalism. Um, there's a, of course, there's some discussion now in the 1990s that the history is, the history ends, the end of the history discussion by Francis Fukuyama. The Western idea, including liberalism, capitalism, and democracy, uh, can no longer be challenged by the communism. Um, or the competing ideas. But now, after, maybe say, global financial crisis, the liberalism concept itself incurs some problems. And global, of course, in the United States, there's a huge economic disparity, and you know, executives receive a huge amount of money compared, whereas the other people who are working in McDonald's cannot get enough salary. And democracy, uh, also uh, demonstrates some of the difficulty to manage the populist movement 
we don't have to refer to Brexit or the President Trump, but there's a, some conceptual challenge to the democracy as well. So this is sort of the uh, three challenges I observed in the last 20 years in terms of the, in the context of rules-based order. And Japan, from Japanese perspective, um, this challenge is a severely uh, critical for its security. Japan is, well, the third largest economy in the world, so I cannot say it's a small country, but compared, militarily speaking, it's the fifth largest, so it's not small. But Japan is not uh, necessarily uh, independent military power because it doesn't have the nuclear power, it doesn't have the completely normal military. So I would just, let me say that Japan is a restrained great power. And for that state, or for Japan's neighboring countries, which is smaller than Japan, the rules-based order is the only one guarantee that they can, uh, they can face the great powers one by one with the same footing, equal footing. So say, for example, the Philippines and China, they have the dispute in the South China Sea. But Philippines could brought the issue to the international uncross arbitration. And there's, a equal, there's a equality in this arbitration. And I, we can, I can go back to the US Nicaragua case or Bangladesh, India case. There's a guarantee for the small, the rules based order is critical for the smaller states to resolve some issues with a great power without resorting to military power or economic coercion. But this is challenged, and um, I already mentioned South China Sea case, but in the East China Sea, Japan is facing China's increase in aggression. They sent, and China sent ships, well, it sent the Coast Guard ships to the surrounding area of the Senkaku Island in the East China Sea, and Japan's Coast Guard has to take care of them every day, almost every day. Um, United States, was fine under the, uh, well, I shouldn't say anyone fine under the anyone. <laughs> I think um, we saw the President uh, Bush uh, ignoring, uh, well, taking a unilateral action apart from the United Nations Security Council in Middle East. And President Obama was a very liberal person, but when it comes to China, uh, he didn't take this tough action at the beginning. So Japan, Japanese government complained to Obama administration at the beginning that you should be more serious about China, more, should, more realistic about China. And now, after 2016 or 2017, January 2017, we got the new president of the United States. There, I mean, from my perspective, the, his policies toward China are partially uh, something Japan asked for the United States doing, um, incur, imposing cost on China's changing status quo in the South China Sea or East China Sea, and rejecting the, some malicious investment from the region, and reducing the risk of the potential information leaking through Chinese company, which installed the 5G or 4G. These are the policies that Japan wanted. But at the same time, the problem of the current administration for the ja ja from Japanese perspective is that they, the United States again, uh, doesn't respect multilateralism, uh, Paris Agreement, and TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, so this is the challenge behind the ja current Japanese foreign policy. Then what Japan is doing is the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy or free and op open Indo-Pacific vision. What is Japan doing? in this strategy. It sounds like beautiful, the free and open Indo-Pacific, it's a broader region, the free and open, that's good. But essentially, according to the government officials, there's the three pillars. One is the protecting the maritime security, or protecting security. Uh, then second is bringing the prosperity through better connectivity. And the third one is this prevailing the universal values, including rule of law, democracy, and freedom of press. These are the three pillars according to the government, but it's still, not clear enough for me. So I would say, I would rephrase, or I would uh, say that this free and open the Pacific strategy has a three constituencies, from my perspective again. Uh, one is the diversification of the partnerships. 
Traditionally, Japan relies on the United States, US-Japan alliance for its own security. Um, there's no alternative to this yet. But after, nine, after 2016, after the free and open the Pacific vision is released, or even a little bit before, Japan expanded the security partnership with other like-minded countries, starting from Australia, India, Philippines, Vietnam, and Southeast Asian states, I mean, ASEAN as a whole, and doing more with Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, and extending to Africa. Well, in terms of Africa still, there's uh, much work to do. So this diversification of policy would be necessary for Japan to have sort of better bargaining position against the United States. This is some new trend. And that can be seen in the economic policy as well. Japan agreed on the TPP with the United States. So originally there's 12 members of the TPP. But the United States withdrew. On the first day of the President Trump took office, they withdrew from the TPP. And I thought that's the end of the TPP. Traditionally, in the history of Japan's foreign policy after 1945, it was very possible, or what, I, I cannot expect anything that Japan can do without the United States, especially in those policy which U.S. considered sensitive. But Japan, together with Australia, um, agreed on the TPP-11, the CPTPP, Comprehensive and Progressive TPP, without the United States. That's, again, part of the diversification. Um, it's diversification of the reliance on the United States as well as the diversifying our economic reliance on China. Japan experienced the economic coercion by China after 2010. There's a collision incident in Senkaku Island that the China, Chinese ship, fishing boat, collided with the Japanese Coast Guard. And China stopped the rare earth export to Japan at the time. It was already planned beforehand, but uh, they implemented at the time. So we experienced economic coercion much before other countries experienced. So this, the first is the diversification of the partnerships. And second is, the, again, protecting the multilateralism or regionalism. Uh, this TPP discussion especially is important in this context. Japan's policy toward the WTO, for example, is that they have to have the multilateral trading system. Without this, Japan cannot sustain its economic growth. And all the potential economic, economic potential of the Asia-Pacific or Indo-Pacific cannot be achieved without the multilateral trading system. So I think uh, even though the Prime Minister Abe has a good relationship with President Trump, superficially, um, <laughs> it, 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 it has uh, some complaints about the American policy. And even though Japan supports some of the U.S. policy toward China, it doesn't support the unilateral imposition of the tariffs on Chinese product. And recently agreed U.S.-China deal seems for me that it, it's the resurgence of the Japan-U.S. trade deal in the 1990s. It's weird. If, if we embrace the multilateral trading system, it's quite strange that the two governments decide a specific numbers for imports or export. So again, Japan doesn't say this um, officially to the American colleagues, but I think if Japan follows the principles, this is a very big problem. And Japan, well, although I said Japan is embracing the multilateralism, uh, that's, also the, that's also true that Japan can not necessarily say the right thing every time they need to say. So this may be the challenge for Japan to do more. And they need more people like me in the government that is vocal and sometimes too provocative. So, but anyway. And finally, uh, self-empowerment is the pillar of the free and open the Pacific. Um, self-empowerment means that they, Japan should have more autonomous foreign policy and autonomous, autonomous military security policy with necessary resources. Unfortunately, Japan still spend 1.2% of the GDP on its military expenditure. It's still lower than the 2%, average 2% of NATO. Um, Japan's, well, that amount of military budget is equivalent to 5% of a national budget, whereas we spend 33% on, on the social welfare services, 25% on the interest of the national debt, 
and we just spend three percent on the education. So I, I cannot say that the Japan is doing enough in this self empowerment pillar, but I think um, Prime Minister Abe is trying to direct Japan to invest more in the, not just military, but also new technology. Um, there's some news that Japan will promote the development of the 6G uh, without investing in the 5G. Um, that's a little bit, um, um, <laughs> I, I hope the dreams come true, but um, it's a little bit idealistic, but it's really important to have to explore new area especially the sophisticated technological area. And government will promote those uh, technological um, education and investment. So I have, of course, I have to, I want to touch more upon the Japan-China relations and Japan-US relations, and uh, of course, Japan's effort in the Southeast Asia in a more specific way. But I think I spend almost 20 minutes now, so I will stop here and then want to have the more questions. Well, thank you very much um, for uh, a very um, comprehensive presentation of how you see uh, Japan um, in its region, as, as you say, uh, certain aspects of it um, could be developed further and no doubt will be in, in the question and answer session. Um, it, it is striking um, to us also uh, that, as you mentioned, the 2008 uh, financial crisis um, was, after the end of the Soviet Union, um, the main uh, catalyst for the kind of problems we are all faced with now, uh, because it itself gave rise to uh, populism, uh, but it also showed, as I think you mentioned, uh, that China could isolate itself, could insulate itself from this kind of development and could develop so far further. Um, the diversification of partnership uh, after 2016 uh, is indeed striking um, because, uh, as you say, um, in my time in Japan, there was already talk of um, putting out feelers to Australia and India, but it's extended further to uh, the Philippines, um, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka, um, and indeed ASEAN, which is also always an important partner for Japan. Um, regionalization um, in the sense of continuing with the Trans-Pacific Partnership without the uh, United States is also a striking uh, development in regard to uh, Japan. And uh, self-empowerment, well, um, I think that Japan is faced with the same kind of dilemmas as Germany is when it comes to self-empowerment. Um, if uh, Japan now spends 1.2% of GDP uh, on defence, um, it has to be put against the background of Japan being uh, what the third biggest economy in the world. 1.2% uh, of Jap Japanese GDP is a very big figure indeed. And if it were to go up to 2%, it would in itself pose a problem. So um, this by way of um, uh, summarizing what you uh, have said, uh, Hannah san I throw the floor open to questions and comments on uh, the subject. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, two uh, sorts of questions. The first is, um, to what extent has it been difficult to build partnerships with countries in and around Japan in light of uh, uh, the things that happened earlier in the 20th century? And secondly, um, what sort of strategies has uh, Japan and other nations in the region uh, been considering in terms of trying to be robust towards economic coercion? Because to me it seems like Japan and perhaps India are the most robust in this, but many nations, many in ASEAN specifically, are incredibly vulnerable to that, and that seems to be a bit of a, uh, a blockage to meaningful progress. Sure, sure. Great questions. Um, may I answer? Please. Well, regarding the difficulty of building partnership with the country which had the historical def deficit with Japan, uh, from Japanese perspective, um, I think 
they, I, I'd like to compare two cases, the Japan's relationship with the Southeast Asia and Japan's relationship with South Korea. Um, in terms of Japan's relationship with uh, Southeast Asia, it actually um, becomes really substantial after the Fukuda Doctrine was released in the 1970s. Fukuda Doctrine means that Japan promised that Japan will never be the military power, doesn't uh, become the economic monger in Southeast Asia, and promote a people-to-people -people and heart-to-heart -heart relationship with South Southeast Asian states. And Japan paid a compensation for those states and also squarely faced the history based on the, based on the evidences that all available in uh, that's basic I mean uh, all available evidences. Um, now Southeast Asian states, including the Lee Kuan Yew who passed away unfortunately, said that we never forget the history, but we will move forward based on you know memory. And so Japan uh, what I want to say in this is uh, twofold. One, Japan squarely square faced the history and did necessary things. And there's a forgiveness by Southeast Asian states. And in terms of South Korea, as you right, maybe know, as you know, may know, <coughs> there's a difficulty in Japan-South Korea partnership. Um, on the one hand, Japan apologized for South Korea uh, several times for its atrocity and colonization. And I, I myself think that we should continuously and maybe forever squarely face the history and use that history for, as a lesson for our foreign policy or any policy. That, that's my own belief. Um, but at, some, at the same time, there's a problem in Japan that some conservative politicians said the denialist uh, statement about history. Um, and also, and then that statement is picked up by South Korean media, and there's a big issue. So Japan cannot be innocent in this sense. At the same time, um, there's a, I, I don't feel a strong sense of the forgiveness from South Korea. Maybe from their perspective, it's because of Japan, lack of the apology or the not sincerity. Um, <coughs> but. Uh, South Korean domestic politics sometimes uses the history issue for just getting support from the uh, general public. So unless, and then I don't know, I'm still struggling why they still use the 70 years ago history for um, the current uh, general election or the presidential election. Um, and of course, uh, one of the interpretations that South Korea uh, was unfortunately part of the Japan in, at the end of the war. So they were the losing side, unfortunately, because of the Japan's, of course, policy. But so they couldn't fight the independence war, the independent war against Japan. Uh, Japan was defeated by United States, China, and the other allied states. So they missed the opportunity. Um, I hope they would no longer use the history issue for the current station, uh, current policy, we, we can continue, to dis continue the discussion on the history, I mean, as I said, forever, but we should separate this issue from um, the current issue. And that attitude is still missing, I think. Um, mm -hmm. that, that, that's maybe the dif difference between Japan and uh, Japan's relation with the SEA and South Korea. Um, in order to be re resilient to the economic coercion or any other coercion, um, Actually, there should be alternative. So I talked with a Cambodian expert several times last year, and they said Cambodia doesn't want to rely on China. They want to rely, or they want to have the other power or other countries joining the Cambodian market or infrastructure project. And from their perspective, Western country rejected, I mean, didn't come or impose their own values, universal values, on Cambodia. And because of their elections, way, way of doing election, they, I mean, Western country didn't invest or almost prohibitable for us to invest in Cambodia. Then they just rely, have to rely on China because Thailand, uh, Vietnam, they all enjoyed economic growth, whereas the Cambodia is all isolated. So Japan's free and open to Pacific strategy is providing the alternative. And sometimes Japanese government said the free and open the Pacific and Belt and Road Initiative are not in competition. They, are, they can be in harmony. But it's, 
I think from my perspective, it's a competition because two companies are selling the same product, similar product in the market, right? Then the one side, it's a cheap and then less tight, but a little bit res less resilient or environmentally not environmentally degradable. And the other one is expensive, high quality, but some and sometimes there's a political tie. So the two, com two products, the two companies are competing in the same market at this moment. And I think in order for the, in order for Japan to be, uh, sorry, in order for the regional countries in the Indo-Pacific be more resilient to China's coercion or even American coercion, the Japan's or other countries, like-minded countries support for becoming, for providing the aid and an infrastructure project, which is more based on the private sector, would be helpful for them to be, to be resilient. And of course, then the second thing is the keeping the rules-based order again. Um, if there is a rules, I'm sorry, if there is some um, area that we don't have rules, we have to create the rules. According to Foreign Minister Motegi, he made a speech in December at the My Institute. The Japan's definition of rules-based order, or Japan's way to protect the rules-based order is, first of all, keeping, preserving the principal rule of law. Second, abiding by the existing rules. And third, creating the rules for necessary place and then reforming. So if we challenge this first principle, we could be called as a revisionist country. But if we just try to change and make this rules better, it's just a reformist. It's the constructive attitude toward the risk-based order. And that's Japan is doing, I think. John. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, you said that Japan is uh, trying to diversify its security interests by building new uh, relationships with countries like Australia and India. Uh, my question is, to what extent do these new relationships include a security cooperation dimension? And what is the attitude, if, it, if they do, what is the attitude of the United States? Are they happy with this, or is there a certain resistance uh, from them? Thank you. Um, I think you are, your question is about the substitutability, also the U US perception on the diversification. As far as I see, um, current diversification is designed for complementing US-led order. Um, as I, I just uh, had a discussion with the ambassador before coming here, but Japan's, what Japan want in terms of international order is a horizontal order. That's why the rules-based is very important. But we are not naive to believe that the rules-based order can be sustained without any balance of power. We need balance of power and a favorable balance of power. Then Japan still uh, have the faith in the US-led order, especially in the Asia-Pacific theater or Indo-Pacific theater, given the increasing influence of China, we think the United States, is, the presence is indispensable. So Japan's diversification is basically trying to complement this balance of power with principle of the rules-based order. And as far as Japan is, for example, cooperating with Australia, together with the United States. I mean, there's a uh, trilateral maritime exercise, and there's a trilateral investment cooperation agreement between among the three countries. Um, US doesn't oppose, US welcomes. And with India, we have the Malabar exercise, this maritime exercise uh, conducted in the Bay of Bengal or Sea of Japan. That's also with the United States. So um, maybe the term of diversification is not necessarily true, but it's still it's complementing the alliance with different means or the new means. Um, so the question or dilemma that Japan should face in the future is that if the United States doesn't respect the, this horizontal international order, just prefer the America first hierarchical order with the hierarchical balance of power, what can Japan do? That's the dilemma. Um, at this moment, even though the supreme leader of the United States or in the executive leader uh, occasionally or frequently uh, disregards the uh, multilateralism or loose space to order, we have still the strong bureaucracy, strong military, uh, I mean, the military people who have the 
fully embrace the rules-based order. So US-Japan alliance is not fragile to one individual president of the United States can destroy. But um, if this kind of selection of the leader continues in the United States, that would be really difficult for us. And in that situation, real diversification might be necessary. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I just want uh, to ask, um, if these rule based order are broken, is there consequences? Because I don't see the point of having the rule based order without consequences. For example, America is, has pulled out of many things which it shouldn't have, but when it comes to America, America can violate any a treaty it doesn't want, and there are no consequences. For example, it went to Iraq in 2003, when the United Nations has clearly said there are no weapons of mass destruction, and instead of Europe uh, holding US accountable and other countries, Europe, European Union joined America, and to this very day, the issues are still not resolved and no one is mm. taking accountability for that. Mm. So what's the point of having rules that cannot be enforced or mm. people have to pay for the consequences? Mm. What's the point? Mm. Mm. That's a really good question, I think. Um, that's unfortunately the case in the South China Sea. We got the UNCLOS arbitration in July 2016, which denies the nine the shrine of China's claim over the South China Sea. But what about the situation now in the South China Sea? China still have the artificial island and militarize them. And what's the cost for China? Maybe that's your point, I think. It's not, maybe you talked about the United States, but maybe it could be the same for China as well. Um, oh, if you want, yeah. You want to yeah, say? no, I'm saying the way I look at things is that there are big countries where it's like banks too big to fail with services, too big to hold accountable. That should change mm -hmm. if a meaningful change is to happen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it doesn't matter, as you are saying, this rule based order is meant for other countries to have voices, but there are big countries that have got very big voices that only they can be heard. Uh, you know, other countries cannot, uh, they cannot be held accountable because they are big. Well, I think what you said is the perfect rules-based order, I think. If, I mean, if we can have uh, power to constrain um, great powers and make them, force them, abiding by the existing rules, I think that's a perfect rules-based order. That's same as the domestic governance system. We have the court, we have the police, and if someone made a crime, they could be arrested and they'd be sent to the court. That would be the perfect, I mean, ideal rules-based order. But unfortunately, in the international system, I don't think that we can have it. We, as I said, it's the limited form. So there's some ignorance by great power. Iran ca Iraq case and China, South China Sea case, that's the two examples that the great power just ignores and doesn't abide by the international law. Um, so then, but that two cases or other cases, among, among, I mean two cases among many, cannot be the reason why we shouldn't seek the international rules-based order. Say, for example, the WTO, again, sorry, I'm studying the international economic rules and the international regional, regional uh, integration. And China is very much abiding by the WTO rules. And if there is some panel established and discuss the China's uh, uh, violation, not violation, but the uh, subsidies to the domestic state-owned enterprises and if the result is, even if the result is unfavorable to China, as far as I understand, they, China has abided by this ruling. And that's actually increased China's uh, credibility in the international economic system. And that, of course, the incentive is that the China can lose investment from other countries if they don't abide by WTO. 
So I think I agree with you that we need uh, some cost, cost-imposing strategy on the violation by the great powers. And unfortunately, no single middle-sized country can do this. If, even if Japan tried to impose a cost on the United States, that's really limited. But what about Japan, Australia, you know, India, EU, all stand together? And that's actually what the Japan, US, and EU did against China in the WTO field. So coalition building among like-minded countries is critically important. And that's still, I'm not too pessimistic about this. Um, and then great power in the multipolar system, no single great power can decide everything. As you rightly said, they sometimes ignore the rules, but it doesn't mean that they can decide everything. So in order to prevent the one country or two great powers like China and the United States decide everything, the third pillar or the coalition of the states, I think it still has a potential to preserve the limited form of rules-based order, I think. Yes, Claude. Thank you. Um, question on Europe. Um, it's the matter of the expectation from a Japanese perspective. It means that we cannot expect Europe to be standing all issue together with Japan in the Asian Indo-Pacific theater. Say, for example, Japan has the issue with China in the East China Sea, Senkaku Island, but we don't expect Europe to be standing with us or even the, using the military means to you know, protect Japan's territory. That's of expectation, we, we don't do have it. Um, what we, I mean, I personally think the importance of the EU is the normative power, normative influence. Um, I cannot count up the, all the cases that Europe made a great leadership in making rules in the international arena. And they are, maybe one of the, my friends in Japan who work on the EU, said that it's because they are always discussing rules within the EU. <laughs> so they, are, they can just, it's quite easy for them to go international arena and make the rules. And that, that's actually some weakness of Japan. Um, we are trying to improve our capability to be normative leader or rule maker rather than rule taker. But still, unfortunately, uh, it's not enough. So we expect EU and Japan co to cooperate more in this rule making. Uh, maybe it's not neutral <laughs> escaping place. Um, it's in, even if we have the, I mean, because of the US China rivalry, as I said in the, my ans previous answer, the cooperation among the, the rest of the countries would be important. So maybe I'm not necessarily rightly answering to your question, but. Uh, that's my perception on you. Uh, it, am I answering to your question? So I was specifically interested in the, the mm. 5G arena because mm. another country addressed the monopoly and conundrum ah, of and telecommunications. Mm. Um, it, it might relieve the issue for many European states where um, China is very active in their economies, so they, they naturally feel uh, that they want to leave their economies open to In terms of 5G, um, Japan's policy is following the United States, uh, rejecting the Huawei from the critical security, uh, sorry, critical uh, digital infrastructure. Um, Japanese, according to Japanese government official statement, it doesn't name China, it doesn't name Huawei. It says that the companies which may have the relationship with the government 
shouldn't be the part, the, the, the vendor of the 5G network. And, but at the same time, according to Japan newspaper, Japan economic newspaper, the actually Japanese companies trading with the Huawei, 70 billion dollars last year. It's huge, 70 billion yen, sorry, 70 billion yen, so. Much seven, less than 70 billion dollars. <laughs> 700 million dollars? Yes. Yes, yes. Um, so we had a huge economic interest in keeping Huawei alive. Or, um, that's really uh, difficult, but if Huawei wants to be the trust for, uh, trusted by the, say for example, many European countries or Japan, there are still things they can do. Um, they still have the data center in China, and China has the national information law, which can ask all the entities in China provide the information if government asks. If that exists in China, that law is existing in China, and Huawei still put the headquarter in China, maybe we cannot trust. So, unfortunately, it could be seen as intervention from Chinese perspective, but the, because of some domestic law that China, PLC has, uh, their companies are losing benefit and opportunities. So maybe we have to continuously encourage the Chinese companies as well as the Chinese government to reconsider those authoritative or more controlling type of laws. Um, that, that's, I think, um, it's not happening yet, but I think that's maybe necessary. Um. Um, thank you very much, Anderson, and thank you for, for coming. It's great to see uh, uh, Japanese uh, intellectuals happen here, and it should happen more often. Um, anyway, a uh, quick question uh, about the US uh, relationship with North Korea and the thinking, current thinking in Japan um, about uh, what is going on there, if mm. you'd like to speak to that. Mm. Mm. That's a really difficult question. <laughs> I, will, I want to ask help for um, <laughs> but, um First point, uh, we should have more visit by Japanese, yes, and um, that's maybe a good comment for the embassy staff here, so <laughs> Itakura-san. Um, uh, regarding North Korea, we, I mean, even at the time 2016 to 2017, when the, there's a discussion, negotiation, between US and North Korea, Japan was not optimistic about the future prospect. Uh, American request for North Korea was the dismantlement of the nuclear facility, the nuclear capabilities that North Korea possessed. But North Korea just asked the United States to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. So from the beginning, they're saying the different things and is trying to seek the agreement. That, that's actually difficult. I mean, I thought it's almost impossible. And now, that said, um, North Korea uh, continues its uh, missile and nuclear development, and still, as a Japan, which Japan is very proximate to North Korea, and we can't even allow North Korea to possess the short or medium range ballistic missile which can deliver the nuclear warhead to Japan. Unfortunately, President Trump some point last year, I think in summer, said that short or medium range ballistic missile is not our concern. And that was a big shock for Japan. And we are continuously um, pushing this issue to the, to, in the Washington DC. Um, but um, I, I can't predict the future scenario, but from Japanese perspective, the ideal one, ideal scenario is that U.S. and North Korea agree on the dismantlement of the all new North Korea's short and medium-sized ballistic missile together with a nuclear warhead. And the worst case scenario is that the North Korea will launch the missile against Japan. And from this spectrum, maybe we are now seeking the uh, freezing the nuclear development and then missile development in North Korea together with the United States. And the some unpredictable variable is the China's policy. And we saw the U.S.-China cooperation before 2016, but now I don't quite sure. I'm not quite sure how China deals with North Korea situation. To be very honest, I'm not. Um, I cannot. Uh, I'm not familiar with the current negotiation or Japan's perception very well. So I can just say uh, basic things. But that that's um, my view.
Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not expert on this, sorry. Yes, sir. Yes. Hello, I'm Justin. What is the current state of um, Prime Minister Abe's attempt to change the Constitution? Oh, that, that's uh, a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Prime Minister Abe, in his speech at the, in January, so this month, still mentioned the Constitution amendment and uh, was one of the, his agenda be until, I mean, um, by 2021. But I personally think that is difficult. Um, maybe there's uh, two reasons. One, domestic support is not enough. Um, half of Japanese people want to have the change of the constitution, but 80% or 70% to 80% are still opposing to changing the Article 9, which prohibits, uh, sorry, not prohibits, but it uh, renounces the military forces. Um, of course, the first paragraph is fine. We, Japan doesn't resolve to war as a means to resolve international dispute. This part is completely fine, but the second paragraph is a problem. Um, th but general public, and there's no enough sufficient discussions in, in the public space about this. And second is uh, Abe's political capital, whether he has enough capital to change this. He is now, he's basically busy in terms of international issues. He is busy for Russia, territorial dispute with, with Russia. And he also said he is ready to negotiate with North Korea for abduction issue. And continuously busy with the Trump administration, keeping the relationship, and we have to observe the next presidential election. And domestically, uh, he got a little bit of a scandal issue recently, but it's not severe enough to, to change Abe administration. But he has to spend some political capital on this. So I, I cannot expect the change of the constitution. And even in the post Abe era, um, I don't know. And um, after 2015, Security, peace and security legislation, Japan now enacted the limited form of a collective self-defense with the United States. So in terms of peacetime security cooperation, Japan's already reached the necessary point. Maybe the question is how we can deal with the wartime scenario and is can we really defend ourselves with, it, with this constitution? This is still, this is the discussion that security communities are doing but not necessarily um, prevailing. Could I ask a final question um, in relation to the Chinese One Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, we had um, a, a couple of people from uh, the, um, uh, the um, what should I say, the research community from Japan here a few years ago, and, and they were very opposed to um, the idea that Japan might <coughs> participate in, in the One Belt, One Road initiative. Um, if I understand correctly, um, the Japanese position has evolved a, a little since then. But when you describe um, the diversification of partnership um, uh, post-2016 uh, that has taken place uh, in Japan, uh, it looks very much uh, um, to be um, to be constructed uh, along the format of the uh, One Belt part of the Chinese initiative, uh, which of course has to do with very sensitive uh, choke points in transport, uh, in maritime transport. Um, but the, the One Road part of the Chinese initiative, uh, I know many people say that um, it doesn't have the same uh, impact that it seemed to have five or six years ago, but it's still uh, very important, and it goes across Central Asia uh, to the Middle East. What is the Japanese position in regard to uh, this particular Jap Chinese initiative? The basic position is that Japan, uh, Japan's free and open the Pacific and Belt and Road has a space for cooperation. And they, Japan clearly uh, set the four conditions for cooperation. One, openness, transparency, openness, and financial sustainability of the recipient country, and economic viability of the project. If the project satisfies with the four conditions, even, well, 
regardless whether that was labeled as a BRI project or not, Japan can cooperate with mm -hmm. China. This is the position. Um, actually, this is consistent with uh, Japan's uh, infrastructure investment policy, mm -hmm. even before the emergence of the BRI. And uh, actually, there's a Sino-Japanese cooperation in third country at the private level. So I'm a little bit critical that the Japanese government asks the private sector to cooperate with the Chinese contractor mm -hmm. in, third, in the third country. It's something the private sector would decide based on the cost-benefit analysis. So um, at this moment, Japan opens the opportunity of window of mm -hmm. opportunity mm -hmm. for China to mm -hmm. come with us mm -hmm. if with the satisfying conditions. Um, and then still nothing happened. Mm -hmm. um, so does Japan participate in the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank? Not yet, and okay. then I don't think so. As far as the United States is out, well, I'm here to uh, I'm here to say that Japan is a very autonomous and independent country. But as a matter of fact, it many times it, may, it follows the United States in its decisions. Um, so AIB things are. And mm. also, Japan has a significant interest in the ADB. Mm. Uh, of course. All the president of the ADB, Asian Development Bank, is a former or the incumbent officer of the Ministry of Finance. So it's the significant benefit or uh, interest that Japan has in the ADB. So the benefit of joining the AIB is still um, not so much and not enough for Japan to take mm. the different policy with the United States. Mm. And of course, Japan's concern is twofold in terms of BRI. One is the debt trap, the so-called debt trap. In Hanban Tota of Sri Lanka, um, that, was the, that was the particular case that uh, China's BRI would, um, uh, wouldn't satisfy with the conditions that Japan want. And there's a discussion. Of course, Japan was shocked when Japan lost in the high-speed rail uh, high-speed railway in Indonesia, from Jakarta to Bandung, um, and China got the deal actually. That was a shock. But after that, Japan's approach is investing in the metro system in Jakarta with a high-quality infrastructure. And Indonesian high-speed railway, for example, doesn't make any progress because China didn't do the sufficient uh, examination of environmental damage and negotiation with the local communities. So I think uh, we have to be concerned about that trap, but at the same time, if there's any problems in the project planning, we don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. They will just uh, fail, or they don't make the sufficient progress, unfortunately, mm -hmm. for the recipient country. Mm -hmm. um, from Japan perspective, quality matters than quantity. That Japan doesn't have the sufficient capital to mm. invest in all of the regional countries. Mm -hmm. But based on the selective and the very deep analysis by JICA, JICA is the Japan Economic Corporation so as agent, um, they are always examining the potential risks and then economic viability of the project. So once they started investing, they would make some result. Mm. And this quality infrastructure idea is our setting point mm -hmm. and maybe if maybe in some cases if china uh is getting closer to our principle maybe there's a potential cooperation mm -hmm. area uh, but at this moment japan doesn't make any compromise in these uh, conditions oh. i think mm -hmm. to the bri mm -hmm. and i hope the other european countries also be requiring China or encouraging China to be more rules based and then you know promote the mm -hmm. high quality infrastructure through the BRI. Well we are participants in the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank as indeed I think are most European countries. Um, Helena san we thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I was struck by um, your remark on the possibility of a, a development in uh, Chinese-American trade, which would parallel what happened in Japanese-American trade some 40 years ago. Um, this is the setting up of quotas and quantitative ceilings for trade. Um, I recall very well a scene where I think Representative Patricia Schroeder took an axe to a Toshiba radio outside the Capitol building in Washington. Uh, this was the state of Japanese-American trade relations some 
40 years ago and thankfully uh, the United States recovered from this feat. But they, uh, I think you quite rightly say the possibility of their um, relapsing into such um, a, a situation has not uh, disappeared. Um, I thank you for the openness with which you dealt with uh, the questions and the comments. Um, I think because you were open, uh, it has been very enlightening for all of us, and I thank you for coming. Thank you very much for inviting me.